Good morning. My name is the Reverend Don Smith. I'm the pastor of Sturge Presbyterian Church in San Mateo, California, and we're awfully glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. As we begin the celebration of Advent, which is the beginning of the Christian church year, we're mindful that it requires preparation for us to truly recognize and appreciate what God did when he brought Jesus into the world. It requires us to prepare ourselves, but we also need to recognize how carefully God prepared for the coming of his special son at that time. So let's pray together as we begin this journey. Lord, just as you brought Christ into our lives in a special way and prepared for that coming in special ways, help us prepare ourselves now spiritually for your coming, that in our remembering again the birth of Jesus, we may find ways of being even stronger in our witness and love for you as we recognize your love for us in his coming. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> when I uh, have couples that come to me for marriage counseling, and I, I haven't had a marriage for a long time, I always go over the various parts of the marriage ceremony so that people can understand why we do the things we do. And of course, the first thing we talk about is the procession. And it really is important, I think, for couples to understand that the procession is a part of the wedding ceremony so that the people who are gathering to witness the vows recognize that the couple didn't just walk up to each other and say, let's get married, but that there was a, a long time of preparation before a couple could begin to really understand what it meant to live with this other person for the rest of their lives. And as the couple had to take time before they could come to this place, so those who are gathered have to go through a process of waiting until the, the vows can be said while they go through personal memories of maybe their marriages and the, the meaning of the vows and the importance and uniqueness of this special moment that will bring families together in new ways and, and all kinds of um, changes will come. And so as we come to Advent, we need to remember that God didn't just send Jesus, but he, he prepared the way. And two of the gospel writers understood this very well, Matthew, uh, did a genealogy that showed how Jesus was the result of all of the work that the Holy Spirit was doing through generations beginning with Abraham, who was the one who established the relationship with God at the beginning, and also King David, who was sort of a model disciple, the, the one who had great power and God loved very much, but who disappointed God at times and had to be forgiven and had to accept God's judgment against his life. And so then there was Luke <clears throat> and Luke went the other way. Luke started with Jesus in his genealogy and he went backwards all the way to Adam, the son of God. And so we have in the gospels and in the story a recognition that God was has been working for millennia since the beginning of history and since the beginning of Israel to bring about this moment when Jesus would come into the world. And so let's look at some of the scripture that we can read and, and learn from as we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah, 
His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. <clears throat> Once, when he, Zechariah, was serving as priest before God, and his section was on duty. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, and, and this is important that you listen to, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Now let's just pause for a moment. <clears throat> Can any of you remember someone in the Old Testament who was given the same instruction not to drink strong drink or and there was another um, what do we call, limitation put on this person in the Old Testament. And if you think about it, you'll remember that Samson was a Nazarite. He had a Nazarite vow attached to his birth, just as now John the Baptist has. And I also want to comment on this conversation between the visitor and Zachariah. A lot of times we sort of take the idea that these special moments in scripture are meant to be poetic, that they may not be literally true, but they may be uh, just a way of expressing inspiration. So let me share with you an experience that is part of my ministry in the past. Elsie was married to a, a farmer, and the farmer had two sons, and the parents of the farmer lived across the road at another farm. And this man was going through emotional problems. He was having a, a mental breakdown. And the family was concerned about him because every time he went out the door, they were afraid that he would harm himself on a tractor or machinery and take his own life. So one morning I got a call from his wife, Elsie, and she said, I need to come in and talk to you right away. And so I welcomed her and she came into the office and she told me that the night before, <clears throat> her husband had been walking back and forth in the living room while she lay in bed wide awake. Finally, he came to bed, went to sleep, and as soon as he was asleep, she said, I got up and I was walking back and forth in the living room. And she said, Don, I heard a voice. And the voice said to me, do not be afraid, Elsie. Everything will be all right. And she said, when the words were spoken, I felt this calm come over me. And I was able to go to bed, go to sleep right away and sleep all night. Am I going insane? Is there something wrong? And I said, Elsie, <clears throat> I think you had a genuine visitation. And I'll tell you why. Every scriptural visitation begins with the words, do not be afraid. 
And the second characteristic of a genuine visitation is that when the words are spoken, what the words say happens. And when you were told that you didn't have to worry and the calm came over you, that to me is a sign that you had a genuine visitation. And she went home and a week later, <clears throat> Her husband voluntarily signed himself into the state hospital for treatment. And even though there were still things that he had to deal with when he came home, he didn't commit suicide and the family was able to work through all of this worry and anxiety. Now, let me go on. These are the things, this is the call that John has from God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before Jesus to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And what I take this to mean is since one of the commandments was that People, children should honor their parents in order to live long in the land. This is the same commandment, but the other way for parents to love their children, to care about their children, to bring the two generations together. And secondly, <clears throat> to get the people who have been ignoring the covenant and have been going their own way to begin to listen to the wisdom of the righteous and to help make Israel prepared for the coming of Christ so that they would hear his message. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I'm an old man and my wife is getting on in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. That's the strength of God. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you'll become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. And I, I suppose we can understand that. We don't want you calling question into this. <laughs> we want to do this, and we want you not to be able to um, discourage people from believing it. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak, but when his time of service was ended, he went home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. And in that time and in that culture, women were expected to have children. And the fact that she had not conceived and had a child all these years was um, something that made her unhappy. In the same way that Samuel's mother was unhappy for the same reason, and when she finally had Samuel at the Lord's direction, she dedicated Samuel to be the, the Lord's, and he became a great prophet. Now, I'm curious about why she remained in seclusion for five months. Um, is it because as an older woman, she was afraid she might lose the baby before it was born? Um, Certainly, Zechariah, being a priest, being someone who was involved in the temple worship, John would have been raised with this idea that he had a, a role to play. John is sort of a different person. Um, he's, he lives out in the wilderness and he eats locusts and honey and those things that are found naturally in the wilderness. And so what, you know, was his personality in part, 
because he was born into this situation and so on. All we know is that God was working with John to help him prepare the way for Jesus. Now, when John went out into the wilderness and became an adult and began to work his way, Mark tells us that he was as if the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the phrase, make his path straight, reminds me of the Psalms and the parts of the prophets who talked about when Israel was going to be brought back from Babylon, their way would be made clear because the high places would be lowered and the valleys would be raised so that their way back to Jerusalem and to Palestine would be e easy because it was straight and it was flat. And here we have John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. That's what John was born to do. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus answered him, let it be now. So, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Now, I want you to think about these two men standing face to face. John knows what his role is. And he realizes that Jesus, in the way the world thinks, is above him. He's a servant of Jesus. And so he says, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not even worthy to tie your shoelaces. And, you know, you come to me for baptism. Well, that's respect for Jesus coming from John. And when John, when Jesus says, but let it be so now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is saying to John, this is appropriate. This is your calling. And I bring myself to you for the ministry you can provide for me. And that is showing John respect. These two men are demonstrating the kind of relationship that Jesus and Paul are encouraging Christians to have in the church. That instead of our always, you know, bossing each other, we serve each other and we bring the spirit of God into this relationship. And so John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. And so part of John's contribution to the life and spirit of those who gathered around Jesus was water baptism. But we have in this passage from John, John saying, I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so we have baptism with water and we have baptism by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is interesting. This is from John chapter four. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. 
Now, this is an interesting aside that John tells us. For some reason, Jesus didn't baptize himself, but he left the disciples to baptize. Now, one of the things that is plain in the beginning of John's gospel is that many of the early disciples that Jesus called were disciples of John. John introduces these disciples, Mark and John and, and Philip and, and Peter and so on. He introduces these disciples to Jesus and points out Jesus as the one who is the lamb to be slain, who, who will bring uh, forgiveness for sin. And it's, it's that introduction that begins the process of some of John's disciples beginning to walk with Jesus. Now we know that later, John has questions and he sends disciples of his to Jesus saying, are you really the one who is to come? And Jesus' answer is, tell John what you have seen and what you've heard. We know that in 325, when Constantine brought all the religious groups together into the Christian fold, that there were still disciples of John at that time. The, um, the book of Revelation, if you look at the um, Anchor Bible version of that book, the author suggests that the book of Revelation is basically a vision that John the Baptist gave to his disciples. And that a couple of chapters in the beginning and a few chapters in the back are like bookends that make the book of Revelation a Christian document. And it may have been, well, that this book was a, a way of helping the disciples of John feel comfortable joining with the communities of Christ because then their founder's vision was part of the record that the church found to be in the canon. So we have John being called by God into service as someone to prepare the way for Jesus. He brings us water baptism as the means whereby he prepares Israel for the coming of Jesus. And that as the ministry of Jesus moves through, what then becomes part of the ministry of Jesus is bringing faith into the relationship between persons and God, where the Spirit of God then dwells in us and brings us to a fuller understanding of what God is doing in our midst. And that John and Jesus at this point are two parts of God's work bringing us back to God. It just seems like it's important for us to understand that baptism is important to us because it's, it was something our Lord established as something he needed to do. And therefore we become baptized. But I want you to remember what John Chamberlain said last week when he preached that when Jesus describes the last day, the question that is asked is not, do you understand the Trinity? Have you been baptized and so on, but rather have you cared about, have you ministered to the least of these, my brethren? And so as we prepare ourselves now for the coming of Christ, let's prepare ourselves for those things that really matter to Jesus the most. God bless.